<sighs> you sure you want me to answer that? There are actual beings that exist in a higher frequency and can lower themselves and feed upon what it is that we're doing. They feed upon our energy and they need a host. And that really where this, this debt slave mentality actually comes from that. And once they don't have our attention, which is our energy, and then we have our energy to do just what you said, create as who and what we are, a limitless immortal fractal of God, rather than a host for parasitical entities. Now, if we start to rise above body consciousness, we move from thinking to knowing and from emoting to loving, and that cannot be fed upon. And they know that. So when you work with yourself optimally, they're defeated automatically. If you don't work with yourself optimally and you keep emitting thought patterns and emotional patterns, this is actually the chi that they, that, that they feed upon. And this is actually what creates the matrix whose we believe it to be real and true. And our reality is created based upon what we believe to be real and true. But it's absolutely energy harvesting to our attention. RJ Spina, welcome back on Just Happen, brother. Just as we started off last time, I'd love to know what are you most excited about right now in your life? Thank you for having me back, Emilio. We both uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Couldn't wait to do it again. So here we are. Uh, what am I most excited about and most grateful for and thankful for in my life? I, I don't remember what my answer was before, but I, I can tell you that it, it's it's simply to be here, to be here right now, to be able to experience what is going on here, to play a role in the awakening and the ascension of humanity, to be a servant to, to our own liberation and freedom, to our own evolution. I'm excited to be here and participate. And uh, I feel honored that I, that I get to that I get to do that and play that role. I think that's what I'm most thankful and excited for. Mm. Well, your excitement has not wavered because the last response was very similar along those lines. Mm -hmm. And you said before that a rising tide will lift all ships and humanity for all of its existence has been operating within a certain band of base frequency, as you call it. And it almost seems like right now we're turning up the dial on that base frequency is a whole different frequency. So I'd love to just take a pulse on what that new frequency is that we are ascending to, that we are headed to um, right now. What is the new base frequency for humanity? Well, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're leaving behind the third frequency. We're, we're experiencing the thrashings of a dying consciousness, which is a, a three-dimensional or what we call a three-dimensional reality. And we are moving up the frequencies. We're, we're going to be able to tap into more of our astral abilities. And we can think of astral abilities as uh, the clairs in general, clairsentience, clairvoyance, claircognizance, uh, teleportation, telekinesis, things like that, bilocation. Uh, we're going to start to move into the ability to do that <clears throat> as we get into the fourth full frequency. That's when some of those talents and abilities will come online for, for some people, not everyone, but for some people. Now, how this really, from my perspective, Emilio, how this works, we can't be attached to anything here, right? Because if we're stuck, attached, or identified to anything here, it's like when Spider-Man shoots his spider web to a building, right? He's, he's stuck to that building. Spider-Man's not going anywhere. That's a silly analogy. But if we identify, attach, or are stuck to anything here, then we cannot let go of that and then therefore ascend. So what we're, what we're realizing is the true self. I think humanity is starting to get a much better understanding of who and what they really are. And through this tangible, not mental, through this tangible understanding of who and what we are, we'll leave behind the identification with the body or body consciousness. And as we leave, and the body consciousness, our physical body is part of and attuned to the local environment. So the more that we detach from the identification with the body, the more easily we're going to be able to move into, into the fourth frequency. And our astral body and our astral 
talents will start to take over. And we have finally, from my perspective, we have we have finally kicked up on the upswing. We were descending the frequencies for quite a while, for quite a while. Uh, but I feel the upswing, there's been a shift and it's and it's recent, Amelia. There, there's been a shift. And I feel like there's the 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 pendulum has swung to now where, where more it's more about 60% give or take 60% of the population has awakened enough for us to move into the fourth frequency. There, there always has to be um, an equilibrium and there always has to be an anchor. So <clears throat> it's never going to be everyone all at once because that would actually cause more problems than people realize. But I feel like we're, we're on our way to shifting into the fourth frequency. And let me just add one thing because I, I feel from my direct experience, there's some misunderstanding about uh, if you're familiar with the yugas, right? Uh, I see a lot of people or a lot of people are telling me that we're, we're, we're still in the Kali Yuga. We're not. From my direct calculation and experience, we're about 234 years in the upswing of the first section of the Dwarpa Yuga. We left behind the Kali Yuga roughly, ar roughly around the same time of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So we're about 240, 250, give or take, into... Dwarpa. So we have already started our ascension. And now what we're really doing is building momentum to take us into the, into the fourth full frequency or what people call the fourth dimension or fourth density. But to be accurate, it's the, it's the fourth frequency. And there has been certain, there have been certain figures around the world in, in many past civilizations and decades that have been able to ascend that frequency within themselves and then create a whole ripple effect throughout all of, all of humanity. And even today, we're still benefiting from these teachings. Last time, you left us on a little bit of a cliffhanger when you mentioned, uh, when we talked about Master Sananda, uh, Jesus. And a lot of people are now questioning, why are there missing years of Jesus Christ uh, in the Bible? Where did he go? What, what was he learning? What was he teaching? Um, to your knowledge, what were those lost years about for Jesus? What a question. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> the first thing I want to say is I've been teaching the Bible deconstructed, which is a 30 week course. And I, I think we're on part three divided into five weeks. So there's six sections. So I have been taking from, from my perspective, the probably the most misunderstood and misinformed sections of the Bible and deconstructing them from, uh, a higher consciousness, enlightened perspective in terms of what's really being said. Did this really happen? And if it didn't really happen, what did really happen? Okay. Hmm. So in terms of your question, Master Sananda, the being in that incarnation, we know, we know as, uh, as Jesus Christ and Christ means christened or to be purified. So his earthly father, Joseph, St. Joseph is, is an incarnation of also an ascended master. We know as master R master R's had, Incarnations such as St. Germain, Moses, Merlin, Gilgamesh, Plato, Amelia Earhart, Francis Bacon, many, many, many. Other. I list them all in my self-mastery class, by the way. Okay. Now, Joseph, his earthly father, transitioned out of his body when Christ was 12. Now, <clears throat> because of the, uh, the life plan, the, uh, that was going to occur, that was underway. And because of the, the near supreme sort of purification ability of Master Sananda, when Joseph left his body, his earthly son could see him clearly. So it, it's not like his father actually left. He left physical reality, but Christ was attuned to be able to see his father. Now, his, his father, Master R, St. Joseph, stayed with him and led him to Egypt, where Christ started to learn about healing modalities. And many of these healing modalities were actually put, placed here within this realm by other incarnations of Master R. So Master Shenanda began to become very well-versed in these advanced healing systems, starting with Reiki was one of the things that he learned uh, through the teachings and through being with his, his father, who is now disincarnate. Now, after that, Christ actually, and I go into a lot more detail, in my, like, otherwise we'll, this answer will take three hours. Eventually, Christ made his way to, to India. And of course, 
his earthly father was escorting him the whole way. Now, when he made it to India, this is when he met with Mahavatar Babaji. Babaji is the most advanced soul that has ever walked this earth and will ever, that will ever walk this earth. And he is the teacher of all the ascended masters. And this is when the training got kicked into massive overdrive. And so Christ was not only learning from an incarnate Babaji, Master Babaji, who can who can materialize and dematerialize at will. So not only was he working directly with Master Babaji, he was also continuing to work with his earthly father, the being that we know as Master R or Saint Germain. So, and this took place over about 18 years. His training lasted roughly about 18 years. And then at that point, the purification had been complete. And he had reached, uh, once again, he had reached authentic cosmic consciousness. And this is this is actually when he returned. And there's 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 one thing I'll add to this. There's something very uh, unique about Master Sinendo. His level of purification, he has perfected. That being has perfected purification. Now, the reason why Master Sinander, Jesus Christ, could perform these miracles is because, and almost no one knows this, and I have talked about this in my class, because of this level of purification that Master Sinander has mastered the ability to purify himself and his close relationship with Master R, or his, earth, his earthly father, Joseph, Master R, and all those other incarnations, and Archangel Michael. Now, Master R and Archangel Michael do a lot of work together and they do a lot of work together with Master Sananda. They are uh, a trinity. When Master Sananda incarnates, there's always this trifecta, this trinity that's working. So because of the level of purification of Master Sananda, Master R and Archangel Michael could work through Master Sananda at the same time. So this is, this is the trinity of love, wisdom, and power that is really unmatched and unparalleled. So the things that Christ could do, Christ could have done anything. If he wanted to slam his hand against the earth, he could have caused an earthquake. Now, this is actually why his ability, once purified once again, is almost immeasurable. It's because two of the, two of the most uh, energetically powerful beings Master R, and an incarnation of Master R is also Archangel Uriel, by the way. So two of the most powerful energetic beings, Master R and Archangel Michael, are able to work together because of the purification of Master Sananda. And this is where we get to, and not just this, that incarnation, but other incarnations, they do that quite frequently. But it was through the culmination of his teachings that he was able to do this. And when he returned, he was fully christened, he was fully purified. and Master R and Archangel Michael were able to work with Master Sananda as one being, which allowed Christ to literally do anything. Hmm. And there, there keeps coming a, a figure in that story that keeps coming up for me, which is part in part of Sananda's union in that incarnation as Jesus, um, which was his counterpart, Mary Magdalene. So talk to us about, about her. What was her role in, in Jesus' purification in that lifetime to be able to do these beautiful, magnificent things? Well, that, that lifetime is another great question. I'm not surprised. So that, that lifetime was stacked for success. So <clears throat> let me give some context. Clearly, Master Sananda is an incarnation of, a master, uh, of an ascended master. Joseph, his earthly father, is an incarnation of an ascended master. Mary not technically an ascended master because there's i can give that definition later but operates at the exact same level with the exact same love and wisdom as an ascended master and then christ's counterpart his partner in that life is actually a soul mate now what what, what does that mean that means that his his partner is another piece of from the same higher self as master sananda so it was integral absolutely integral and we, we start to take a look at how everything was stacked for this incarnation to be wildly successful 
uh, the three wise men are incarnations of ascended masters as well. Sri Yukteswar, Mahavatar Babaji, and the being that we know as Yogananda. So, it, 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 he had the whole team with him. The, he was like, "Let's all go. Let's yeah, all go." Yes, <laughs> it, it, because this this was the this was the um, it's the right way to say that um, it was the end of an age. It was the end. It was the end of the, the end of an age, and Christ took it to exactly where it needed to be taken. Master Sananda took it to exactly where it needed to be taken, and all of these beings were well aware of how important this incarnation is was. And so, of course, they wanted to be part of it to ensure that it was a massive, a massive success. Uh, none of it could have taken place if it wasn't all working together perfectly, absolutely perfectly. So there, there was no way that that incarnation wasn't going to be a smashing success. There was absolutely mm. no way. Yeah. And you mentioned that that term of the soulmates um, mm. between Mary and Jesus. And I was wondering, because, you know, they probably incarnated their soulmates. They had an attraction, a sacred union. What, what is the role of sexual energy within purification as, you know, he went through that purification? Is there, is there room for that when we're purifying ourselves using, utilizing that energy? Oh, wow. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking you were going to ask me that. Interesting. Not that I think about what you're going to ask me, Emilio, but a uh, fascinating question. Okay. The, the point, the point of uh, sex intercourse, right, is to procreate out of love. Hmm. Okay. That, that's out. Correct. From the love to procreate from a, from a place of pure love to create out of the place of pure love, just like everything here that was created out of pure love from God's source creator, same thing as above, so below. So the key the key is to actually uh, to continue life or create life from that divine place within ourselves out of pure love. So that that's actually the point. Now, uh, I, I might as well say it, Christ had many children. Christ had many, and again, I my Bible deconstructed course talks about all this and much, much more. He had many, he had many children. Now when, and the goal in terms of the, the, the uh, sexual energy was to procreate from a place of love. Now, so hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Now, what is the role when you ask me, what is the role of sexual energy? That's a very interesting question because it's the purest creative force. It's the most primal creative force, right? This, this urge. Now, Many mystics, masters, authentic mystic masters and yogis will, will tell you that that energy is best utilized to bring up the chakra system and purify the body rather than um, expelling that energy from the lower chakras. Mm. Okay. Now, it's not right or wrong. It's not good or bad. But I can tell you that authentic mystic masters and yogis tend not to, unless it's out of love, to, to procreate, to create life out of love. If that is not really the case, then most authentic mystic masters and yogis will take that, take that sexual energy, which is really the low frequency, most primal form of creation, and run it up the chakra system and, and use it to illuminate themselves. And again, this is not to say to someone that if you're having sex or intercourse, stop. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, because of your question, those type of beings would use that energy either to procreate out of love or they would use that energy to have it run up their spine and completely and utterly illuminate themselves. And in doing so, heal themselves as well. Hmm. And now that being the end of an era, going into a new era that we are sort of living in and a part of, um, with the inception of, of Count St. Germain, um, talk to us about the way that he brought himself, that being into this new age to assist humanity with what we're going through right now. And what were the main, what are the main teachings of a being like St. Germain, you know, utilizing things like violet flame for transmutation? What are we learning right now as a species? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Saint Germain or, or Master R 
is uh, kind of acts like a uh, manager is not the right word. It's not the right word, but he kind of acts like a manager. He is the manager, so to speak, of this new age, this age of Aquarius. I think St. Germain and all his other incarnations, uh, he has obviously reached a level of, of complete self-mastery. He has he has learned how to transcend life and death. He's learned how to put a, his own destroyed body back together. He's learned how to bilocate, telekinesis, teleportation, alchemy. There's really, he is the, the master of the mystic arts. He is the absolute master of the mystic arts. In fact, he is known as the Lord of Alchemy and the master of energy. That is what he's he, Dr. Strange. He lit <laughs> Dr. Strange, that character right up into the Cape is exactly taken after St. Germain. That's who that character is. Now, St. Germain and all his other incarnations, and it's really the higher self projecting pieces. And those pieces, one is known as St. Germain, one is known as Merlin, one is known as Monas, Moses, Plato, and on and on, Francis Bacon, on and on and on, Amelia Earhart, right? And uh, I've said before, uh, and I've said publicly, I'm from the same higher self that produces the incarnations that are known as an ascended master. So I am deeply connected and part of all of those incarnations. Uh, today, I'm RJ, right? Now, we must understand that that higher self uh, or master R is an embodiment of a, of a vibration and a consciousness that humanity is going to be working with that will take itself for its own, the, the greatest efficacy of its own evolution by moving us into the fourth frequency and the ascension of the frequencies. He is an, an embodiment of a level of consciousness that is exactly what is needed for humanity to take its next step in its own evolution. So he keeps, he keeps incarnating or that higher self keeps projecting pieces of itself into our, into our version of earth and our specific timeline to help move the consciousness to its next level. He's kind of the embodiment, not just that incarnation, all the other incarnations, an embodiment of the missing ingredient, although it's not missing, the, the missing ingredient. It's like adding just the right thing to a stew. It's like it tastes good, but it's missing something. And then you add this one spice to it and you're like, ah, oh, perfect. So his, his consciousness, is kind of like that missing, it's an analogy. His consciousness is kind of like that missing spice. So he's the quarterback of this new age and he keeps, re he's quite active. In fact, he's the most prolific, that higher self is the most prolific uh, ascended master in terms of its uh, work with earth. That higher self, Master R, the being that we often just call Saint Germain, has had 181 earthly incarnations and 120 non-earth incarnations. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, he's, yeah, he's just kind of like the quarterback. He embodies a simplicity. His teachings are so simple and so profound and so effective because he has mastered himself. There's no fluff. The guy never wastes a word, right? Everything lands directly. It's powerful and it's tangible. And so he's, yeah, he's, uh, He's a very interesting character. All his different incarnations are a very interesting character. Uh, but I, I do want to make sure everyone understands it, it's never the exact same soul. So if someone said, and I just said that I'm from the same higher self, I am from the same higher self, but I am not that exact being. And I want everyone to start to understand how reincarnation actually works. Okay. So we often think that we'll, we'll just stick with, we'll stick with St. Germain. So we often think that that exact same soul is now the next lifetime and then the next lifetime and then the next lifetime. That is that is not accurate. That is not how it actually works. Think of a screwdriver, right, with an interchangeable head. Okay, so the screwdriver for the most part is about 80 to 90% universal. And what changes is, is the head on it. Okay, so after each incarnation, the higher self will make adjustments in terms of the amount of sentience, the quality of sentience, and actually what, what egoic traits that still remain within the higher self, what egoic, egoic traits would be beneficial for this next incarnation that would help uh, the fruition of the life plan to happen. So there's this change that happens. Now it's essentially, it's essentially 80 to 90%, the exact same higher self, or what we'd say the exact same being from an earthly perspective, but it is not. It is not. So reincarnation has to do with the higher self making slight adjustments, changing a little bit of the sentence, changing the quality of the sentence, the amount 
of sentience as well. And then being imbued with certain personality, human personality traits that are left over from those other incarnations that would be deemed useful in the incarnation to make sure that it's a success. Hmm. I am a huge fan of Avatar, The Last Airbender, and I just watched the live action film that they created on Netflix. Um, but, you know, I, I really i am drawn to these types of series because there's so many spiritual truths within them. And Aang, the main character, he is the avatar of that time period of humanity. And the avatar is the one that can master the four elements and can bend fire, water, air, and earth. And along that series, he learns, and not to spoil anything for anyone, but he <laughs> learns how to connect with his previous incarnations. So he's able to draw upon the wisdom of all the past avatars that came before him. Do you have a process or what has your experience been with connecting with previous incarnations and getting advice, wisdom, um, guidance from, from them? What's that been for you? Oh. What's that like? <laughs> Amelia, I'm repeating myself with another amazing question. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's a, a meditation and we just, we just did this meditation in the San Diego workshop. Uh, and I've, I've used to teach this meditation actually as a course itself. And maybe I'll uh, do that again at some point, but to, to truly reconnect with your other incarnations, to truly reconnect with your higher self. The first thing I want to say is, you are your higher self, okay? Just like an octopus drops a tentacle down to see what the water is like here. Okay, so you and me are the tentacle, but the tentacle is part of the octopus. So we are our higher self, just less in volume, about two and a half percent. Now, when we come back to and reconnect directly with the higher self, that is what self-realization or enlightenment actually is. When that has been normalized, OK, not just like a moment or so or, you know, what had this one meditation and then you're kind of back to body consciousness. OK, so the normalization of making that connection permanent. So an analogy that we could use is if you have a your bat as I'm looking out of my side yard, if you have a yard. Right. And Amelia, you start cutting across the yard in, in the exact same way over and over again. Right. You wear out the grass. All of a sudden. There's just dirt there. It's a dirt path because you're, you're wearing out the, the grass, right? Because you have continually gone over the same thing over and over again. So when we meditate to reconnect properly by going up the frequencies and the dimensions to where our higher self resides within the multiverse, if you do that often enough, it's just like cutting across the backyard. There is now a permanent connection, an absolute permanent connection. And once that, excuse me, once that permanent connection is made the the information or the uh, the wisdom, the access to everything is online. It's absolutely online. Now you have to bust your behind to be able to make that connection because when we're all the way down and it's not down, it's just lower frequency. It's all it's all right here. You actually have to become very diligent, very dedicated to be able to. And this is, that's guys, like I said, this is what self-realization or enlightenment is. It's the, it's the permanent unification with your higher self, even while you're here. That is what enlightenment is. And there's much past enlightenment, but by doing a meditation over and over again, right? You're wearing out that path and pretty soon you have this connection and then it can literally, the wisdom will just flow because the finite mind or body consciousness has been turned off. You no longer identify with the five physical senses in terms of constant analysis. So if we stop the constant analysis of the data stream that's coming in through the five physical senses, which is what actually creates your finite lower consciousness or the intellect, once you stop identifying, you'll cease with the constant analysis and judgment. And now the connection that you've made, that's the information that will be flowing nonstop, literally nonstop. And beings that, that actually do that are authentically enlightened, enlightened beings or self-realized beings. And so it's, it's constantly doing it over and over and over again until that connection is solidified and normalized. And then the information will flow without a stop. And you've mentioned before that, you know, we are not the first advanced civilization that has the opportunity to participate in these practices. And 
you know, when looking back into in highly advanced civilizations like ancient Egypt, you talked about they had certain technology that was able to help them in turning that dial of the frequency to be able to interact with the other bands of frequency that we might not be aware of with our physical senses. What were they using back then to your knowledge? Yeah, the, uh, and I think I, I, did, I talk about that maybe with uh, Alex on Next Level Soul mm -hmm. one time. The, uh, so there's, I mean, there were several devices that were used in ancient Egypt, and most of them were technologies that were a carryover <clears throat> from, from Atlantis. Now, and these, these technologies are often given to humanity by advanced beings, often, often by ascended masters who are the true teachers of humanity, and they're the true architects of our civilizations as well, the advanced civilizations. So one of the devices that they used in ancient Egypt was a carryover from, from Atlantis. So we can think of it, uh, let's think of a radio. We have to have some context of it. Think of a radio, right? So you turn the dial on the radio. Those of, those of you that are old enough to have one of those radios still, you turn the dial on the radio and you go from 95.5 to 99. Point seven, whatever, right? Okay. So ancient Egypt, and it was a carryover from Atlantis, they had a device where when they turned the dial, it literally raised the frequency of the local environment. So what would actually happen is everything that, because we're all in the same space, there's no there, it's only here and now. So everything is here and now. So when you turn the dial, the local environment, it, it would then present itself and you could see, or the in ancient Egypt, they could see what was existing in higher frequencies in the local environment. So they would be able to garner information and interact with advanced beings that were in higher frequency states, uh, still incarnate, but in higher frequency states. And they would garner the information and knowledge and they could communicate with them. So it was, it was like a radio, only in terms of an analogy, but it literally changed the local, the local environment. And it was a it was a dial, and if we look at some of those pictures, if we look at some of those pictures, th that little purse thing that is depicted all the time not all the time that is depicted quite often in uh, pictures of uh, ancient Egypt that that it was it was carried around with them. Is that the ankh? Yeah, that they, that's yeah. what they would be, and it had to do with sacred geometry and crystals. It would create. Not a portal. It's not the right. It's not the right way to say it. Um, but sacred geometric patterns are actually the gateway into higher states of consciousness. They they're the true building blocks of all form and function. And when we start to return to working directly with sacred geometry and then using certain crystals and frequencies, we're going to be able to actually recreate that device that I talked that I was just describing. And that is something that they absolutely used. And it was a, it was a carryover from from Atlantis. Hmm. And I'm really curious, how have you, because I know you love crystals, how have you utilized crystals in this lifetime um, for your own purposes of, of ascension? Yeah, so uh, there's never, there's... <laughs> oh, he pulled it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't know if there's anybody who loves crystals more than I do. Okay. Um, and they're all over the place. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, there's too many of them. But um, I, I, I kind of view them differently. So... How I use crystals, I use them as an amplifier for my kinetic intention. And that's, that's also, so I don't, I'm not using the crystal. I'm, I'm making the crystal amplify what I'm doing. If that, that makes sense. And yeah. by the way, yeah. Merlin, also an, an incarnation of, of Master, Master R, right? So Merlin's staff, by the way, was made of holly wood. Let that sink in. Casting a spell over humanity, Hollywood casting a spell over humanity, right? Okay, uh -huh. there, there you go. So Merlin, the real Merlin, uh, his staff was was made out of Hollywood. Now <clears throat> it also had metal, and at the end, at the business end, was a crystal that was clasped. Now wood, metal, and crystal are great amplifiers of electricity. So. Merlin would use the staff, just as I was explaining, uh, as an amplifier 
an amplifier of his powerful desire and intention, his kinetic intention to create. Abracadabra, I create as I speak, which is what abracadabra means. So when you work at a very high level, you can then use crystals, wood, metal as an amplifier. And I think perhaps what uh, most of us do is that we, we kind of um, give our power over to the crystal, if that makes sense, or to the... Uh, I find that if you do it the other way around, uh, it's it's far more powerful and effective. <laughs> and and wow, an insight that just came through is sometimes we don't even have to look outside for these crystals because knowing that we ourselves have piezoelectric crystals inside our pineal gland mm -hmm. that amplify our intentions. If you want to expand on that a bit further, yeah, that's we we. Okay, so that is, that's the indirect, this is what happens indirectly. So when we, from my perspective, when we focus just on the pineal, I actually think we're doing, we're, we're doing it incorrectly from my perspective. So we want to raise our frequency, right, through proper, what I call proper meditation, raise our frequency. Now, by raising our frequency, we're automatically going to start to activate the pineal gland. And one of the ways that we can do that is as we're raising our frequency, we can actually, and we just did this meditation in San Diego, by the way, we raise our frequency, we can actually take the energy that was trapped in our mental body, trapped in our emotional body, trapped in our etheric body, our trauma, right? Take that energy and actually bring it down and then bring it right up and place it right into the third eye, which also activates the pineal gland while in a higher state, uh, a higher frequency. It works like magic. So that's, so the pineal gland gets activated when you work with yourself in a higher frequency way. I don't think, for, again, just from my perspective, I don't think addressing the pineal gland directly is actually the way to do it because it automatically gets activated when we work when we work with our higher mind. Mm. And going back to Merlin for a second, there was a moment in your life, I think it was around seven years ago, where you were in a room and couple of your past incarnations appeared to you and Merlin was there and he looked at you. What did that gaze mean to you when he was just like staring at you? What, what was he trying to convey? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I try not to get emotional about it. Um, I mean, it, it, it changed my life. Uh, I always suspected certain things about myself. Um, doesn't matter, but I always just suspected certain things about myself. Uh, and <clears throat> that was, that was shortly there after I had put my body back together, uh, from being paralyzed and really sick on top of being paralyzed from the chest down. And, uh, I remember that moment like it was yesterday and, um, it, it was, it was, I, I, it was confirmation that I needed, I needed it. And that's, that's why it was, that's why it was given to me. And in, in that moment, everything that I had suspected as a kid, why I used to, chant certain names over and over again as a mantra i was trying to wake myself up i was literally th those were names of other incarnations from my higher self and i was say these names over and over and over again literally to wake myself up at that moment with other incarnations from the same higher self uh it was just acknowledgement of what i've always felt was true what i always felt that i knew to be true within my heart um why I feel the way I feel, um, why I'm so odd, why I'm just so odd, um, why I, why I love the way that I love. Um, it was, it was confirmation for me and I needed it to continue my work as RJ. And in that moment, everything I suspected about myself was, was confirmed and it was confirmed, not with words, not with words, but what was emanated from the look that he gave me. And it was almost like, do you get it now? Hmm? Is it not clear now? Kind of like that. <laughs> Merlin doesn't muck about, by the way. Merlin does not mess around. Um, so that that moment was the confirmation that I needed to continue my work. Um, it's not that I have doubts because I don't have, I've, I, my finite mind has kind of been shut off. It's, it kind of leaves you. Um, it's not that I have doubts, but it, it gave me that, not inspiration. That's not the right word either. Confirmation. It almost allowed me. 
helped allow me to continue my work as RJ to break new ground and, uh, and just serve at the highest levels that I possibly can, which is my obsession to keep going past what is possible, do the impossible over and over and over again. And that moment was my permission slip and I'll, I'll never forget it. Yeah. And a lot of the times just being fully seen in the presence of another being or another human completely changes the trajectory of our life. And, you know, you had to come across certain moments where this was this instance that you just described is like being fully seen by yourself with a capital S. But you've also had to tinker around with being seen and looking at your ego mind identity. You said you have three notebooks filled <laughs> with conversation, question and answer with yourself that led to life altering epiphanies. If you want to lead us through what that process was like for you in those notebooks, talking to your subconscious programs, reprogramming your mind, what was that like? Yeah, uh, it was it was complete liberation. It was complete liberation. I mean, that that book, the, the most recent book, Change Your Mind, <clears throat> that 14 day notebook exercise is literally how to completely and utterly wake yourself up and remove all programming that has been planted, brainwashed into our subconscious mind. The, the process, I, I, I outlined in the book, Amelia, the very first question that I asked myself to begin the deprogramming afforded me a massive epiphany. The very first time, the thing about brushing my hair, which you, you know you, pr you probably read, I, the, the moment that that occurred, I knew that I was not far away from becoming self-realized again. I mean, I could feel it just from that one question. So, <clears throat> and I wrote the book because I urge humanity to remove all limitations that have been planted into your subconscious mind because that voice in your head is not yours. That is the matrix. Now, the only way to remove it is to go through that, not the only way, a very effective and powerful way is to do it, is to follow the teachings and, and change your mind. The, the epiphanies that I was having during the 14 days, I, it's like every moment a disguise was being taken off. It's, a, it's like Clark Kent was first, he took off his glasses, right? Then he took off his sports coat and then he took, right? It's like, it, it felt like the unveiling and that's really what it was. The unveiling of the I am, the mighty I am. And every single question, every single moment, it's like I expanded, became lighter and freer. And there was less energy in my lower astral and mental, which is where a lot of the subconscious program kind of sits. The, the, the deep rooted stuff sits in the, in the lower astral and the, and the mental, by the way. So it was literally just every moment I, I felt like I was getting larger and freer and happier and more loving and more powerful. And I, I, I didn't want to stop. And I only stopped because I was I was aware of all of my thoughts, emotions, actions, and behaviors. You didn't I, want to waste more paper. I don't like, this right, is it. Right. notebooks. I'm done. That's <laughs> enough. Yeah. At, <laughs> at that point, I was aware of my motivation. My my every motivation that was that was driving my desire, intention, thought, emotions, actions, behaviors. I had regained command over myself, and in that moment, I I was able to own my own mind once again, and that is also part of self-realization and enlightenment. I urge anyone, anyone and everyone who listens to this, get the book and do that exercise because it will absolutely change your life. It'll be the first time that it's your life. It'll be the first time that it's your life. I can't encourage people enough. That's why, that's why I wrote that book. <laughs> yeah. And the essence of that exercise is really understanding our core motivations for every single behavior. So if you'd like to give us an example of what someone can encounter when they're carrying around a notebook with them in their daily life. <laughs> and, you know, like, let's say right now I want to go and, and drink a coffee, for example. Right. What would I do then um, with my notebook? Okay. So you would question why you're doing it. And you're absolutely right. The key is to get to the core motivation of what is driving your behavior. The ultimate in terms of, you know, why, why do we do that? Right. Okay. We want to make sure that we're leading a life that is representative of who and what you really are rather than what's been programmed into your mind. And the only way to know that is to question everything in terms of why you're doing it. The sticking point for, for, 
for human beings, what I found is that they'll ask themselves, you know, why am I doing this? Right. Oh, let me use the brushing, the brushing my hair thing because it's in the book. So the first thing I did was I woke up at like 430 in the morning. I had to go to the bathroom. I saw my my reflection in the bathroom mirror. My hair was a mess. My hair is always a mess. So I saw myself in the in the mirror and without thinking, I grabbed a brush and started brushing. It's 430 in the morning. Right. It's total automaton. Who does this, right? Unless you're programmed, right? So I saw my hair as a mess, 4.30 in the morning. I just grabbed a brush and started brushing my hair. And I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? And I put the brush down. I wrote down on my notebook, brushing my hair. And then I asked, why am I brushing my hair? Now, the first answer we get, no matter what the activity is, the first answer we're going to get is a justification. That's not a core motivation. It's a justification. Don't stop there, my friends. Don't stop at a juicy justification. Your ego mind is the justification for everything. For everything. Okay. So I said, brushing my hair. And I asked myself, why am I brushing my hair? The first answer is because it's a mess. Justification. Why do I care? So I asked myself, why do I care if my hair's a mess? The next answer I got was because I want people to find me attractive. This is 4.30 in the morning in the bathroom by myself, right? I'm brushing. So this is a program. I'm clearly a program I'm running. I want people to find me attractive. So that really, I almost like took a step back. I remember like it was yesterday. I was like, wow, why do I care if other people find me attractive? And the next answer I got was one of the, is the first big epiphany. And it was, I get a sense of my own self-worth through other people's opinion of me. Societal programming, brainwashing. It's exactly what it's a hundred percent pattern subconscious ego of mind getting value by outside of yourself and other people's opinion. And I, that's, so we just, we figure out what we're doing, whether it's text messaging somebody, why am I scrolling through social media? Ask yourself, ask yourself that question and be honest with yourself. Remember, it's just you and a notebook, right? It's not therapist. You're not in front of a whole bunch of people, right? It's you and a notebook. Okay. Be fearless. Be absolute and honest, fearless and honest. Ask yourself why you're really doing it. The first answer to will just be BS. It'll just be a justification. Oh, I'm bored. Uh, but why am I bored? Ask yourself that question. Why am I bored? Why do you need stimulation? Why do I need stimulation? Why? Why? You will find, my friends, everything you do is a program. Mm. Not most of it. All of it. And only until you see what's buried and bring it into the conscious mind, can you then realize that has nothing to do with you. That's not you. That's from mom, dad, college, the internet, the clergy, that whatever, whatever, whatever. That's not from you. That motivation is not coming from, from you. Delete it like an unwanted program on your computer. And what will happen is you'll feel lighter. Because though that is low frequency programming, you're a supremely high frequency being. So as soon as you recognize and delete, you will start to raise in frequency. You will start to expand. And these limitation programs will literally start to fall away. All we have to do is question why we're doing what we're doing. The answers will be illuminating, enlightening, and completely and utterly life changing. Mm. And I wrote this down in all caps, which is in that book, Change Your Mind. You said, until we understand what is truly driving our behavior, we can only recycle our experience. And I come across that in my life, and I can suspect that whoever is listening to this can resonate where, especially for me in, in, in relationships where I'm like, mm -hmm. it almost seems like I'm recycling the same type of experience person archetype and i'm like living through it again in a way why does that happen to people i mean you just said we we have to understand why we have to why our behaviors are driving our actions um why does that happen why do we recycle our experiences oh, okay so well, the short okay the, the short answer is until we're self-realized then that that stops because then, then you actually own your own mind and there's there's no program running at all there's no recycling of anything okay but up up until up until then there's there is experiences whether there there are experiences that we've chosen to align ourselves with or there are experiences that are thrust upon us 
right? And it, and sometimes there's cross pollination. That's the difference between the egoic mind and the pattern subconscious mind. But sometimes they they cross over. We recycle the experiences because that has been embedded within our body of energy. So it's literally been embedded with within our body of energy. And then until we realize, like marbles being placed in, in the book, right? Marbles being placed on a bedspread, right? You put a marble on a bedspread, right? It leaves an indentation. It might be small, but it leaves an indentation. Okay. So our body of energy is littered with billions and billions of marbles. Now, those marbles, when they're indented, when we don't realize this, we're going to recycle the experiences because they're pressing down on our body of energy, which affects our consciousness. So we keep going through that process until we see it in terms of what it is, until we have the light of day in our mind. So it has to get recycled to can we see the truth about the situation and the truth about ourselves. So until we see the truth, it'll keep happening over and over and over again because there's an indentation and or an identification within our body of energy. And our body of energy is a projection of the subconscious mind. So not just our physical body, but the, the larger, more subtle bodies of energy. And there's all these different indentations in them. And that is actually what the programming is within your subconscious mind. And the ones you identify with creates your egoic mind. So we're going to recycle them because there's something pressing down on your energy. And then your mind runs over what the energy is, and then it thinks about and takes actions upon the indentations and identifications. Hence, we recycle it over and over and over again till we see the marble for what it is and then remove it because it doesn't belong to you. Now, you can look at that on the larger scale too. Think about all these different advanced civilizations that we've had. Why do we keep doing this over and over and over again? This is what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. We're here to do it differently this time, my friend. We're here to do it differently this time. We're here to remember and know. We're here to remember and know with a capital K. So when we do it right this time, it's going to be different. The memory will come back online. Just we're talking about the memories of all these other incarnations, the memories of other civilizations. We will stop recycling the experience. Humanity seems to have a never ending appetite for its own demise. And that's because of its own amnesia. And when we work with ourselves in the way that we're talking about, the amnesia is lifted. And then we don't recycle experiences. Now we ascend the frequencies. And that's really what this, this whole new age is about. And then it just opens the door to pure creation, pure creativity, which is what we truly are. Um, you mentioned before as well that we choose our body we choose the timeline we're in we choose the planet we're in we also choose the team that we get put in that was something that really stood out to me in terms of the team mm. are we talking like nba league where there's like a many teams or is it like one versus the other team what is what has that been like for your experience it's 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 more and we can simplify it which helps and doesn't help sometimes but more are we either, are we working toward directly? Are we directly working towards the expansion of consciousness and the liberation of humanity? Or are we directly working towards the subjugation of consciousness and, and humanity and what I call perception management, managing everything so humanity stays in the dark about everything? Now, the darkness, when we when we play for the that side, by putting pressure subjugation, tyrannical pressure upon the consciousness, that actually causes evolutionary tension, which actually causes people to wake up, right? I mean, that's so, so it's still serving, it's still, you're still serving the, the other side, but you're not doing it directly, you're doing it indirectly. So when we, when I talk about what team you play for, you can think of like what you're doing, you are directly working with helping humanity evolve its consciousness and liberating itself, you're doing it directly. Right. And there are people that are doing the opposite of what you're doing, spreading lies, misinformation, trying to control and on and on and on. Right. So directly, they're trying to hold it down. Both end up serving the evolution of consciousness anyway. But that's what I mean or meant about one, playing one side of the team or the other. And we literally get to choose this. And most of us have played both sides many, many times. And that, that might be difficult for people to hear. You're, you know, you're leading a very uh, centered, holistic, heartfelt, heart-led life, I guarantee you've played a bad guy. I guarantee you've played a bad guy. We, we, we play all of them. Even in this lifetime, right? Yeah. Even, even in certain moments and periods of our life, we might play that role with another person. 
or you know vice versa and then we switch up the roles um there's a belief system that you call the debt slave reality mm. and i was like is that was he talking about the nine to five <laughs> what do you mean by uh, the debt slave reality and how did this conception of this belief system come to be you sure you want me to answer that Go as deep as you need, okay. brother. All right, my friend. As deep as you need. You got it. Okay. All right. So let's first give context. Okay. So let's um, let's talk about what a parasite is. Okay. So most of us know what a parasite is, right? It needs a host and it feeds on it. And then that parasite can and often does take control of some of the functions of the host. A parasite can make you crave sugar. It can make you crave certain foods, right? When a parasite, when most of us know this, right? All right. That's kind of what's happening. <laughs> That's what I said. That's kind of what's happening on a larger scale. There are beings, and unfortunately, there's many humans that assist in this, which is actually how, how we get to where we are now at this moment, many beings assisting in this. There are actual beings that exist in a higher frequency, and can lower themselves and feed upon what it is that we're doing. They feed upon our energy and they need a host. And that really where this, this debt slave mentality actually comes from that. That's literally what it is. This has been going on a very, very long time, a very long time. And if we looked within ourselves deeply, we would realize like the books that I write, if you look inside yourself deeply, you will shed yourself of, of this, this debt slave reality that we have that we have willfully projected ourselves into, that we have willfully, intentionally, including me, you, and everybody here, we know this is the deal before we get here. We know this is the deal before we get here because it's an incredible experience and it forces the evolutionary tension for us to work with ourselves more optimally and more powerfully. And that is the evolution of consciousness because we leave here with a, a sturdier back and a more tender heart. That's really what evolution is. So we are, there are parasites that work on our consciousness and our body of energy through harnessing our intention, our attention, by harnessing our attention. And our attention is energy. And that's why they have us look over here, look over here, look over here. And it's always bad. It's always bad, right? They want you backed up, fearful and angry. They want you to believe what it is that's put out there because once you believe it, you actually create it for them. We create the matrix. The matrix is inside your mind and you actually create it for them. So the debt slave mentality does have to do with parasitical type entities that operate whose intellects are far superior, far superior to the human intellect, the intellect that we're currently using in this timeline. It's not superior to our higher mind at all, at all. But to our intellect, absolutely, absolutely. So once we learn how to detach and discern, they won't be able to harness our attention, which is energy. And once they don't have our attention, which is our energy, and then we have our energy to do just what you said, create, to create as who and what we are, a limitless, immortal fractal of God, rather than a host for parasitical entities. Now, I could go further and further and further and darker and darker and darker, but it's not necessary. And let me just say two more things about this, Emilio. These parasitical entities that I'm talking about, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed at all. Okay? That's number one. Number two, when you work with yourself properly and optimally, they can't do a thing. They can't touch you. That's why raising your frequency, you go up and beyond body consciousness you surpass the ego mind identity, which is built upon and with the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic interference of what is broadcast here, the matrix, which is what forms the ego mind identity, the EMI, the electromagnetic interference. When you raise your frequency by turning your dial, you're not affected by what goes on here. You're not affected by what goes on here. That's the key to raise your frequency, to ascend the frequencies. And then these parasites that actually feed upon Thoughts, emotions, low frequency. Thoughts and emotions are low frequency. All of them. Thoughts and emotions are low frequency. Now, if we start to rise above body consciousness, we move from thinking to knowing and from emoting to loving. 
And that cannot be fed upon. And they know that. So when you work with yourself optimally, they're defeated automatically. Automatically. If you don't work with yourself optimally and you keep emitting thought patterns and emotional patterns, this is actually the chi that they, that, that they feed upon. And this is actually what creates the matrix because we believe it to be real and true. And our reality is created based upon what we believe to be real and true. But it's absolutely energy harvesting to our attention. Hmm. And what does this, what you just outlined there, have to do with why masters will advocate for fasting, for meditation, for mastering our attention and our energy? And where, how can we head in that direction as well to gain control over this and raise our frequency? Okay, great question again. Okay, so every authentic uh, master and mystic uh, yogi, they all talk about two things, don't they? Meditation and fasting. Why? Because it works. <laughs> they talk, about, that's why, <laughs> because it works. Okay, so meditation and fasting is, is the purification. It's the absolute purification of mind, body, soul. That's, that's why it works. So think of food as information. It's all information, but think of food as information. So every time you eat food, your body has to decode information. Most of the, most of what passes for food on this planet is not food. I mean, most of us know this, right? It's, it's not food. The soils have been tampered with the water, ev everything, right? Okay. So fasting and meditation will allow you to heal yourself purify yourself and raise in frequency because food also lowers your frequency that lowers your frequency meditation allows you to move past the patterns of conscious egoic mind into your higher mind into who and what you really are so we purify body through fasting and we purify mind and spirit through meditation so meditation and fasting will allow you to overcome anything Anything, I don't care what it is, doesn't matter what it is, because it's all energy. It all can be commanded properly. But those two things to every authentic mystic and master are the key. And that's why they all they all talk about it. It is your purification and your ascension through meditation and fasting. In your self-healing from the from the paralysis, were you fasting during that moment? Because I know you were meditating, you know, hours in the day. Were you refraining from food as well in that process? Initially, when I was, uh, after the, the, the I became paralyzed, uh, I, I wasn't eating much. I was still in the hospital. I was in the hospital and then in the rehab for a total of <clears throat> something like two and a half months. I'd have to run the numbers in my head. So I was, I was being fed, but not much. And I didn't want to eat much, but I was so weak from the sepsis that I couldn't completely fast because I, I think I just wouldn't have been able to um, to perform the rehab. I wouldn't have been able to do it. I was so weak to begin with, but I was eating very little. I was eating as little as I could. And then once I, I was in co a constant state of meditation, perpetual state of meditation. Um, and once I was discharged and I was able to unparalyze myself fully about two or three weeks after, it was exactly a hundred days, after uh, being discharged, I then went on a strict fast because uh, my main obsession was unparalyzing myself. And then once I did that, I wanted to address fasting. So then I did um, uh, I did 14 days of no eating of anything. I had a very small meal, only what I could kind of handle at that point, maybe about four or 500 calories. And then I fasted again for another week. So I really, I really didn't eat for three weeks. And that kind of reset, that reset all the damage that had been done through through the sepsis. I was diagnosed with all these different chronic diseases. And I mean, they disappeared. They just disappeared. Now, part of it is from the fast and the other part is the ascent of frequencies healing technique. And one of the things you do is do you learn how to turn off the program of illness, just like you delete a program from a computer in a higher state of consciousness, you can actually turn off the programs that you're, that you're running. So that was also one of the things, as well as the other steps in the ascent of frequency healing technique, but fasting and meditation, th there's nothing that can't be cleansed, nothing that can't be cleansed through fasting and meditation. And if anyone is thinking about fasting, um, past, you know, like 24 hours, this kind of thing, 
do it with with someone who's supervising or someone who's with you okay because you can get dizzy you can get weak you could have low blood sugar i mean we have to be mindful of this okay so if you're interested in that make sure you do it under supervision but i can't recommend fasting enough if it's done properly with supervision you check your blood sugar you you check the uh i was constantly checking everything when I was doing this. Cause I, I mean, I barely ate for three weeks. I had one tiny meal for three weeks. So I wanted to make sure, and I got dizzy several times, several times I got dizzy. I remember one time I stood up, I had to sit right back down. I got so dizzy, right? Uh, but you'll also know, let me just add, you'll also know when it's time to eat. You'll know when it's like, you know what? I bet I better eat something. So I, I remember that feeling. I was like, you know what? <laughs> I better eat. <laughs> It's time to eat now. So, but you can reset everything. I got rid of all those uh, chronic, dis genetic chronic diseases, which are impossible through the ascent of frequencies technique and, and through fasting. Now, there's so many ways that things outside of us can affect our physical body, like the toxins, the food in our environment. And now that we really opened the gateway on healing, um, I love to ask, how does our astral body affect our physical body? Because you've been talking a lot about the astral self, the astral body. How does how are those two intertwined when it comes to health and illness? Hmm, goodness. Okay. The astral informs and helps create the physical. Okay, so that's kind of like the first the first thing to understand. Now, our astral body, our large our larger body of energy. When we when we're incarnate and we use body consciousness, which is just physical senses, we only see about thirty percent of who and what we are. There's a much, we are much larger. We're about, there's about 70% of what we are that we don't see. And some of that includes our, our astral body. Now, our physical body, which is part of our larger body of energy and our more subtle bodies of energy, which is that other 70% are constantly being affected by what, by uh, the, the greater reality. I'll say it that way, constantly being affected by the greater reality. And most of that is outside of our physical sensory perception and therefore our intellect. And then we have no idea that it's actually occurring. So the astral body helps create and inform our physical body and our astral body is always being affected. You can think of in the simplest terms, thinking and emoting, which we don't, <clears throat> excuse me, which we don't see with, you know, we don't see someone's thoughts with our with our, I mean, we can see them. But we Not yet. Right, right. <laughs> so the astral, our thoughts and emotions, right, are really going into the astral realm. We're creating a very unstable realm. The astral realms, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh frequencies are entirely unstable. And that's because of all the emotions and thoughts and beliefs that we're emanating into that. And that also affects our astral body, which in turn affects our physical body because the astral informs the physical. I hope that makes sense. So the, the whole thing is connected. The whole thing is connected. And so we have to be incredibly aware of our, our every action, thought, emotion, action, behavior. So we're not adding to, to this astral realm, which actually affects our astral body, which actually affects our physical body. Mm -hmm. So ho hopefully that makes sense. This is just part of it. Yeah, because before we started recording, I asked you about what your process is like with the astral projection. Um, and you said you have a very different approach to it. If you wanted to walk us through what that process is like for you and how you teach it in your own way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, my understanding is that it's, it's, it's different. Um, <clears throat> okay. So most of us think of astral projecting as leaving, and it is as leaving your body, right? So your body stays here, right? But your consciousness, which is really your sentience actually leaves and goes to wherever your intention is, is headed. It'll actually just follow your intention, right? And by the way, we can learn, when we learn to follow our intention and we harness ourselves while still staying within the body, that's when we'll be able to do anything by fully aligning yourself with your intention. Just follow your intention. Just follow your intention. Okay. So what happens or what happens? How I do it and how I teach it is not about me leaving my body, right? Now, I used to do that as a kid all the time, and I still do it, but something else has occurred for me. So <clears throat> the image is uh, a Rubik's Cube, right? So we turn, right, turning the Rubik's Cube. Okay. So in this higher state of consciousness, 
I'm actually turning everything so everything is coming to me and within my view, within the screen of my consciousness. Just like you turn a, a, a Rubik's Cube. Hmm. So I'm making everything come to me and I'm not leaving where I am, I'm simply tuning into my higher mind while I'm here and I can bring any kind of information or any uh, reality uh, into my screen of consciousness by almost turning it and bringing it to me instead of me going going there, if that, if that makes sense. And this just started to occur I mean, it started to occur in my 20s where things started to shift. I had a very profound meditation in my 20s and all of a sudden something something just shifted. And really what shifted is more of me. I attuned more of my body mind to the real me and less of my uh, uh, personhood, if you will. And that's when I started to discover that it wasn't about me leaving. It was about me bringing everything to me like you would turn a Rubik's Cube. Hmm. Wow. And, and when you learn about something like that, like th having this capability, having this capacity to do that, are you led then by your curiosity of what you would like to explore um, in the universe or what you would like to learn about? What is like, where, how do you decide with your intention? I want to go there or I want to bring this maybe time period of humanity and explore it. Um, how do you decide or what are you, what are you exploring right now in your journeys? Well, the, the exploration in that in that sense stopped a long time ago um uh for a while that was all i did i mean i, I kind of traveled the entire multiverse and actually even what's beyond uh the multiverse and what's beyond our our god believe it or not um <clears throat> and Hindu so you met dr strange out there yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah so um <clears throat> for me now the the exploration has to do with serving so uh uh, because my my desire is to is to serve at the highest levels that I'm possibly capable of, and and to constantly quote unquote outdo what I did before and go further and further and further and further, uh, which is part of part of uh, just how I operate in all different incarnations. What I kind of use it for is information in order to serve. If I'm teaching a class or a course or or working with someone, I find that. Uh, the exploration comes from me garnering information that will best serve that person in that moment. As opposed to, like it was before, I'm going to sit down and do this and just start exploring, which I, I absolutely did for, for well over a decade, and just exploring everything. At this point, uh, I, I, I just want to harness all of my energy and intention in terms of serving the best that I can. And because I've already done all that other stuff, it doesn't, I'm not called to do that I'm not uh, excited to explore more of the multiverse, even though it's incredible. I rather serve as powerfully, as authentically, as lovingly as uh, as I possibly can. And so I use that in terms of what I'm teaching, whether I'm teaching meditation, a class, a course, uh, or, or 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 even you and I speaking. So I kind of use I kind of use it in in that way, as as opposed to just sort of let me just go off to the. 97th frequency and just kind of roam around. I don't really do that anymore. <laughs> I love that you mentioned the serving aspect because you also said that helping, fixing, and serving are three very different ways of seeing life. So what would you tell to the people that are viewing their life through helping, fixing, and serving? What is that difference? Oh, yeah. Night, night and day, right? Night and day. Okay. So let me first say that more uh, in general, it's always exceptions, more evolved <clears throat> and advanced souls, the people, people like you, people that watch what you do, Amelia, more evolved, more advanced souls. And it's not a competition, but it's also the truth. There, There's a natural uh, compulsion to, to want to help people and to want to fix situations and so on and so forth. Okay, now what's happening is that this, this very natural loving instinct has actually gotten hijacked by your ego mind, okay? And th th this might be difficult for some people to hear, but once they hear it, it'll, it'll, it'll make sense, okay? Helping, if you, if you hold a firm belief that you're here to help, okay? And just, just hear me out. 
If you form a, if you hold a firm belief that you're here to help, that's because you hold the belief that life is weak and that it, it needs help. Okay, life's not weak at all. Okay, that's this natural compulsion of giving love and wisdom got hijacked by the ego mind, and now I have to help. Now we notice that when you have to help, you get burned out. You get tired, frustrated, short-tempered, and burned out. That's because the natural impulse has been hijacked by the ego, the ego mind by holding a belief that life is weak. Life does not need any help. Okay. Same thing with fixing. Same thing with fixing. This natural impulse, right, to love, to share wisdom, compassion, forgiveness, power has gotten hijacked by the egoic mind. And if you're programmed or feel you need to fix, I got to fix this relationship. I got to fix this problem. That's, that's because you see life is broken. Life is not broken at all. And also when you see things that need to be fixed or you're com you ha have to fix that, you're also going to get burned out. You're also going to get tired. You're also going to get frustrated. You're going to get jaded, right? All my, fir my first 200 clients that used to serve were all light workers, all people that were helping other people. They were the, their, their mind and their body was just destroyed because they are this program of helping and fixing, help because the ego mind has taken over the natural impulse. Now, when you serve, when you serve, you see life as whole and complete and you're just adding to it you're just adding to it. You are serving something that is whole and complete. When you serve, you never get tired. You never get frustrated. You don't get short-tempered. You don't get exhausted because you see life as whole and complete. And therefore, you see yourself as whole and complete. And that's a major, major difference between helping, fixing, and serving. They don't even have anything to do with, with one another. And the helping and fixing is because the natural impulse to serve, to share love and wisdom and compassion and power got hijacked into helping and fixing, which will eventually completely and utterly burn you out. Hmm. And what's coming through is it's also how we view, like it's literally a perception because you could hear someone's story and, and maybe a client of yours or a friend of mine, they'll come and they'll, they'll say like, I'm going through this. And sometimes the drama will be so great that we get pulled in the story and we say, oh, that person needs to be fixed or I need to put my hand in there and get them out of that, that hole that they they find themselves in. But when we serve, as you said, like it's seeing that that person is already in the divine order of the universe and is already complete, that you don't have to put your hand and get them out of there and do all these other things, send them the documentary, the book, <laughs> the podcast. Like for you, when you were talking about the way that you dealt with your clients and, and change your mind in that book, it was about holding space. So what is your process when you're actually serving someone and seeing them through the divine? What is the energy that you hold um, in those sessions when you're when you're serving um, humanity and, and other people? You're so brilliant, Emilio. Okay, so everything that I do is for people to recognize the true self within them with the capital S, the same self that's, that's, that's in everything and everyone to recognize that and to hold a higher frequency space and to draw their attention towards that, to bring them back to the whole complete perfect fractal of God that, that we all are. And in order to do that, you, you raise or you hold, hold the space you raise your frequency and you simply direct that person back to the completeness, to the truth, to the truth. That everything that's going on with them, not saying it's not going on with them, it's a story. It's a story. You're the awareness of the story, which is why you're telling me about the story. You can't be the story. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to tell me about it. So you're the awareness of it. So it doesn't touch you. Start to feel that. Start to feel that. You hold the space and you direct them back to the truth, to the truth. And by doing that, you are serving, you are serving by simply expressing your level of wisdom, your compassion, and your love. And that doesn't run out. That doesn't run out. So we can also look at, that's what I do, or I don't work one-on-one -on -one anymore. When I used to work one-on-one, -on -one, that's what I used to do. You can also look at 
that when you when you are totally and completely in tune with yourself, yourself, you are holding a mirror and you're reflecting back to them self-realization. So they can actually see it, feel it, hear it. What does it talk like? What does it act like? What does it move like? So you're actually holding a reflection for them of their true self. And you don't have to do anything to be your true self because you are your true self. And so that's where we get into the service. You're just serving by expressing who and what you are. I don't try to help or fix anything because nothing needs help and nothing is broken. We're all perfect. Our attention is on the story. It's on the story. And if you take your attention off that and bring it back to the present moment, all of a sudden, everything starts to change. And that's really all it takes. You hold the space by raising the frequency and bringing them back to the tangible experience, the tangible recognition of who and what they are. Whole, complete, perfect, divine fractal of God. That's who we are. Mm. RJ. <laughs> These keep getting better and better, better and better, brother. Um, I'd love to wrap up with of course we do the final trio at the end of every show before that you have so much going on right now new events in-person workshops a new book coming out where would you send people to connect with your work further uh okay so my website is ascend the frequencies doc i know that's a long url but ascend the frequencies.com uh the youtube is rj spina ascend the frequencies Instagram is RJ Spina, send the frequencies. There there are a lot of uh, events uh, planned. Um, I just started a course. I'm not, I'm not sure when this will air. I just started my vibrational engineering course, which is the true metaphysics of manifestation. It's the true enlightened metaphysics of manif manifestation. I just started that. That just started yesterday. My self-mastery course, which are the true teachings of self-mastery, that starts April 20th. And again, I'm not sure when this will air. That starts April 20th. I'm doing a work or a retreat in Kauai, a six day retreat in Kauai, which is the highest frequency on the planet, by the way. Kauai is the highest frequency on the planet. So it's the last two days of May and the first four days of June. Join me. And I'm also doing a workshop. Uh, it's not completely finalized, but I'm doing a workshop in Dallas uh, towards the very end of end of July. And that workshop is going to be focused on healing. It's going to be focused on healing. So if anyone is interested in any of these things, just go to ascendthefrequencies.com. You can send an email to info at ascendthefrequencies.com and someone on my staff will get will get back to you. And my third book uh, comes out <clears throat> August 8th and it's called Access Super Consciousness. And just where we're talking about this the, the, the reconnection and communion with your own higher self and your own higher mind, which actually affords us all the information of what we've been, what we are, and what we forever will be. These are the teachings of true self-mastery and access super consciousness. There's 12 eternal truths and the 12 tenets of self-mastery. There'll be information on the ascended masters that humanity has never heard or seen. And <clears throat> there is a paragraph, a paragraph, <laughs> there's a chapter in Access Superconsciousness uh, that is purely uh, autobiographical. I talk about some events that have happened in this lifetime that have changed my life completely. I am so excited, brother, for you and for the opportunity to serve alongside you. It's such an honor. Every time I just get heightened in my frequency, to put it that way. Um, the final trio um, these three are personalized to the guest. The first one being, how does the soul or what does the soul need for its evolution? Experience. Hmm. Ex experience. Nothing more, nothing less. Because <clears throat> it is already whole and complete. It learns about itself through the experiences that it creates. So that's... That is actually how it works. Evolution is understanding more and to know thyself and all thy infinite potential. How do we do that? Through experience. So the soul doesn't even necessarily need experience. It has simply decided 
to understand the depth, the limitless depth of itself through creating experiences. And just one of those is incarnation. And how would you begin to describe the original us? A human being? Us, in essence. Oh, okay. All right, so what we are... <laughs> I used to say these were rapid fire questions. Now I just say they're questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what we are, okay. I mean, we are love and wisdom who subsets our talents and abilities. Now that that is that is actually what we are. Now that sentience, that is the I am, is given energy to create to create the incarnation, to create thoughts, to create emotions, to so I talk with my hands, to animate my body and to make the body have experiences. But what we actually are <clears throat> is love and wisdom. And that's the fractal of God directly. And that's what God is. God is love and wisdom who subsets our talents and abilities that has been given energy to create. As above, so below. Our higher self is exactly that. It is sentience. It is love and wisdom who subsets our talents and abilities, given energy to create. And what, what our higher self creates are you and me, soul or an aspect. And we are that too. That is what we are. Now, the painter is not the painting. So we are not what we create. We are already perfect, whole and complete. And when we create from there, we will see our own perfection reflected back to us. And this must have come from just getting attuned to your work and your energy. But sometimes I go on walks and then I'll get an insight or a download that I have to like write down in my notes. And what came through um, the other day along the lines of what you, what you just said, I, I wrote the only thing that you take with you when the body passes away is your wisdom and your love. Would you agree with that? Or is there more things that we take with us? <laughs> no, you got it. You got it, my friend. That is what we are. Now, to be completely accurate, <clears throat> we are, by having, and specifically by having, like you and I and everyone else, having incarnations into the lower frequencies of the physical universe, which is where things are most challenging, What's happening is our eternal reservoir of love and wisdom is deepening. It is accruing and that's evolution. That's what evolution is. The I am, the love and wisdom is deepening. So you're right, love and wisdom. But when, we, when the incarnation is ended, we take more of the love and wisdom that has deepened and accrued through the trials and tribulations that occur here. And that is evolution itself, is the deepening of our reservoir of love and wisdom who subsets our talents and abilities. That's what you are, and that's what goes from incarnation to incarnation, or frequency to frequency, and dimension to dimension. That I am, the fractal of God, that's what we are, that continually learns about its limitless capacity to love and become wise. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The last question is, what does your heart say when you tune in to your fondness and love for humanity? Oh. that I can't do enough. I just, that I can't do enough. There's uh, nothing I wouldn't do, nowhere I wouldn't go, nothing I wouldn't overcome. I, there, there's certainly no words. There's certainly no words. And maybe someday when Perhaps, perhaps someday when I look back at all these 
incarnations that perhaps I'll feel I've done enough. Brother, that was perhaps the realest um, we've gotten on this podcast. So that's all I'm going to say. And I appreciate you um, for your continuous dedication for us, for humanity. Um, we are your brothers, we are your sisters, and we're here supporting you. So I appreciate you. Thank you, man. You're most welcome. I love you, Emilio. Love and, you too, brother. And I remain your holy brother. Me too. Thank you.